Welcome to the Dark Mind Podcast. Friends and familiars, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Dark Mind Podcast, where we explore the boundless realm of dark literature and film. On today's show, I have a writer who has embraced the solitude of a postmodern monk to create the vast expanse of the Omnist universe. He's joining me today to discuss the first work in the Omnis series, Consumia's Spiritual Emporium. So without further ado, join me as we delve into the dark insight of Rob Weldon. Rob, welcome to the show. Hey, Vance, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for joining me on this first day of March 2024. I came across your book on Bookstagram and was really intrigued by the description of your particular genre as magical noir. So I checked out your book, Consumia's Spiritual Emporium, book one of the Omnis series, and found a dark yet cynically comical story that immerses the reader in the world of a spiritual emporium where spirituality is marketed and sold with esoteric wares and magical gatherings. So I really enjoyed the world you built, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about its construction. Awesome. Well, I look forward to talking about it. Well, so the book is about a place called Consumia's Spiritual Emporium, hence the title, which caters to spiritual disciplines of all types. Many of these disciplines are facilitated by, and I hope I'm not using the wrong term, but the best thing I can think of is gurus, who hold regular gatherings at the Emporium referred to as lodges. And the Emporium also has its own app called The Omnist, where after answering an extensive questionnaire, the client is given a God cocktail for guidance. And one way the guidance is doled out is through phone messages called motes, which are essentially pithy aphorisms. So with all this marketing and charisma, was the book in any way an attempt at satire? And could you expand on your use of the marketing of spirituality? I call these gurus omniscients. So it ties in with the omnis idea and the omnis app. Think a dating app where the more questions you answer theoretically, the better they are at matching you. Here, Theoretically. Though, instead, of, <laughs> uh, instead of matching you with a mate, they're matching you with gods to worship, with prayers to recite, with merch to buy at the Emporium, with just daily aphorisms or reminders. If you're the kind of person who doesn't get out of bed, it might remind you to get out and do something. If you're the kind of person that never stops, it might remind you to slow down and breathe. But yeah, the marketing of it is very, visceral is probably the wrong word, but it's nearly tactile in this series hence the name Consumia. As far as I knew, that word didn't exist, but I think it makes a really cool name and it's appropriate because Consumia Connie, I mean, as she's called throughout the series, she used to be a real estate agent and she wasn't necessarily the best business person. She had some shady practices, but at heart, she's a good person. She's just trying to succeed in a consumer society. And uh, when she loses her license, she had been a pack rat and decided to start selling off some of this stuff. But she learned that if you've got a stack of prayer mats, and let's say there's 20 of them, and you sell them for 20 or 30 bucks each, if she concocts a fictional story that a monk died while in Lotus, and his spirit is imbued now in this mat, she could sell it for a couple grand. And it kept her in business. So she doesn't necessarily believe in this magic, but she knows how to sell it. 
But the problem is that if you open a store selling magic and you don't believe in it, well, whether you believe in it or not, magic's going to find you. And that's sort of what happens here. Gotcha. So Consumia wasn't her actual name. Was it just something she used for branding? No, that's her name. But that's oh, okay. just a little wink and an elbow nudge on my part. She's not aware of my involvement. <laughs> <laughs> so a kind of a play on words as far as consumer? Correct. Okay, gotcha. All right. Well, the book starts out in medias res with the owner of the Emporium, Connie, being served with a lawsuit by one of her clients who's using the Omnist app. And Theo, the... uh Sewer, I suppose you would say, was an employee at Trader Joe's. And one thing that I noticed that every brand in the book seemed to have been changed to something similar and kind of comical, actually, like Face Farm, Slapple, Giggle, Glamazon. But Trader Joe's was left intact. So this is kind of a, a real nitpicky question. It's just the kind of stuff that really makes me wonder, why was that? It's funny. It started that I wanted to make fun of those bigger corporations that you had just mentioned, Glamazon and Face Farm and such. But then I kept going. There's a little bakery in Burbank called Porto's, and I called that Poncho's. In North Hollywood, there's a bar in the series called Los Federales, which is actually the federal. Mm -hmm. So those aren't meant to be mean. I just wanted to wink and nod at people that know this area and know this neighborhood. But every time I go to Trader Joe's, and this is not an advertisement for it in any way, those employees are so freaking happy. <laughs> like, mm. they seem like they don't hate their jobs. And it was just sort of a nod, like, hey, you know, you're doing pretty well. But yeah, virtually every other company is going to be a slight tweak for fun. A lot of it's just for fun, except for the big companies that I'm making fun of. <laughs> well, what was the one for, I assume, to be TikTok? Pickpocket. Pickpocket, yeah, but it was spelled <laughs> with just the K. Yeah, K. Yeah, yeah, P I K. Yeah, P O K. Yeah, I assume that's what it was. I just oh, needed yeah. some confirmation. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Well, the owner of the Emporium, Connie, otherwise known as Consumia, owns a shop that deals with spirituality. But as we were talking about earlier, she's very much the capitalist. And as you alluded to, the view I got from her was she was giving people what they wanted, whether it was genuine or not. Almost as if to say people want to be lied to, in a sense. But even though she was a pragmatic businesswoman, did she on some level feel as though through marketing and creating the story, she was in a sense engaging in her own form of a magical act? And if so, what drew her to this business model, aside from what you were talking about, you know, the rare artifacts, if there's a story attached to it, she can charge more money. Was there something else that kind of drew her in? And could you expand a little bit on that last statement you made about whether you believe in it or not, if you open a magic shop, magic will find you, I think is kind of what you said. Yeah, I think the thing with Connie, which makes her fun to engage with, is that part of the backstory in the book about her in high school was that she was a connector. She wanted to help people. She was a person everybody could sort of talk to. She was a little bit of a psychologist or a therapist for people. She loved especially hanging out in like the art community. And those people tend to be a little more spiritual or whatever without necessarily it being a religion. The spirituality, I guess that's the best word for it. Spiritual, but not religious. Yeah, exactly. And she just really engaged with them a lot. And she does truly want to help people, but she's also a capitalist. And I think you're going to see that mirrored. This is a mirror of what's actually going on in society. Like, doesn't matter if it's pseudoscience or goop. Like, there's a lot of places where they must just be making this up. There's no way that somebody, I think, truly believes this. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't believe things. I'm just saying that it's gone so far that, like, you can just make up, you know, to use Richard Dawkins' thing, the flying spaghetti monster. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I guarantee if you post something that, hey, I just found proof that flying spaghetti monster, he was making fun of that, but it's real and it hurts my feelings, there will be people that believe you, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what did you mention? Goop? Oh, yeah. The Gwyneth Paltrow company where, you know, 
she sells candles that smell like her vagina. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. So that Jake, company is. Yeah, it's real. It's called Goop. Um, why am I selling I, this? <laughs> no. Well, I, I knew. Leave it out. <laughs> I knew it was real, but I didn't know its exclusive intention was to sell candles that smelled like her vagina. I thought there was other stuff involved as well. Absolutely. That's just one of the more ridiculous things that she oh, sells. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Some of it is based in people that truly believe stuff. But again, Connie isn't supposed to judge anybody for what they believe. The whole idea of the omnist is that when you answer all these questions, it's basically getting a profile of your personality and your needs and your wants and desires and problems and whatever. And this personal God package that it gives you, you know, you'll have a God major, God minor, you know, maybe a half a dozen extra gods for flavor. So what happens is that if I've got 150, 175 different gods, that's a hell of a poker hand. Nobody's going to have the same cocktail at all. So that means by definition, every single person that comes into the Emporium has a different religion. So you have to be accepting of other people, just as long as there's no hate speech and you're not diminishing anybody else, as long as you're open to the idea. So I shouldn't be, you know, dissing goop. <laughs> but within the Emporium, though, they absolutely would not. Like, there would be a goop omniscient. And by the way, that's what I call a goo. Did I say that already? Omniscient. So um, there probably would be. I just don't want to bring up that specific company. <laughs> All right. How do you make fun of a company named Goop? Uh, what do you do with the name? <laughs> that name is already it's it's um it's low hanging fruit. I admit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's low hanging goop. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You get points. <laughs> <laughs> well. Theo lost both his mother and father. His father was killed by a drunk driver who, oddly enough, was a priest. So I was curious to know what effect did the fact that the person who killed his father being a priest have on his spiritual leanings? He was already planning on going to college to be an archaeologist. So he was already into evidence-based science. His mother was very religious, but he lost her when she was a child. So um, he was already looking for answers, but he was looking for evidence. And the fact that a priest killed his father had temporarily wiped him saying, I need evidence, 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 evidence. It put him on a scientific journey. But when he lost his girlfriend as well, a little bit later, and he moves to LA, that was basically what starts this entire book, really. Now he's on a journey. He's on a path to find answers that maybe weren't evidence-based anymore. So we're taking a scientific mind and putting them in a situation where you have to believe, you have to have faith in something. And he's learning sometimes that faith is in himself. He hasn't had evidence to believe in himself, but maybe this is how you do it. So he's not so much inherently an old soul. He was kind of made an old soul by... I don't know. I mean, he may have been an old soul from the start. Okay. Just that he was on a path of science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. He is going to appear in a later book. I believe it's going to be book eight. And I'm saying believe because I'm currently about to publish book six and I'm already working on book seven, but I believe he's going to come back in book eight. And we're going to deal with some more of that. Okay. The reason I was asking is because assuming he's about to go to college, what age did you put him at? Well, he's now late 20s. Okay. He was an archaeologist for several years before moving to L.A. Okay. Yeah. So late 20s, approaching 30, I guess kind of getting close to the natural point in a person's life where they start getting a little on the spiritual side. I noticed it gets inherently much more concentrated when you hit 40. I was just curious to know <laughs> his uh, his particular time period in life and whether events kind of turned him into a seeker or if he'd kind of always been a seeker. I think he was always a seeker, just a different methodologies for seeking, I suppose. Okay. Science and then eventually kind of turned to, mm -hmm. towards, you yeah. know. I think he was blocking learning about himself for a while. He wanted to learn about the world around him. But then going to L.A. and dealing with the Emporium, he's learning that a lot of the outward learning actually forces you to reflect inside as well. Mm. And he, he was just readdressing himself, issues that he hadn't dealt with in many years. So basically him losing his girlfriend when he was, you know, an archaeologist mirrored 
echoed losing his mother when he was a small child. Mm -hmm. And that just put him back on that old path that he was probably should have been on the whole time. Yeah, what's the uh, Jung quote? He who is turned outward dreams, he who looks inward awakens. Something to that sure. effect. Yeah. <laughs> sure, exactly. <laughs> well, the vision and feel of the Emporium itself are painted very well for the reader. I was actually talking to you about that before we started recording. And here in Houston, we have a spiritual Emporium of sorts called the Magic Cauldron, and magic is spelt with a CK. So mm -hmm. I know these places, the employees and the customers can have some intense charisma. Was your inspiration for Consumia's Spiritual Emporium based on any real place or places? And if so, could you tell us about it? Yeah, it's an amalgamation of several places. I feel like Burbank, as much as it's known for, say, Warner Brothers Studios and you know the NBC lot and Disney and Cartoon Network, it has this other side that you don't hear about so much. And it shops like The Crooked Path, The Green Dragon, Bearded Lady Mystic Museum, Dark Delicacies, that deal with this whole other side, a lot of spirituality, a lot of spiritualism. And I've traveled a lot. I've been through most of the country, and I don't see this concentration of this in many places. You have to go relatively rural to like maybe, you know, San Luis Obispo or Canberra or something like that. But as a larger city, it's rare. So basically, the idea of the Emporium is that I've taken all of these places and mixed them together to make it bigger and bigger, sort of like without the chain corporation, it's sort of a Home Depot, you know, a, a spirituality clearinghouse. But it's sort of mixed with a tea shop as well and it has a stage so the omniscients can get up there and host lodges. And they might draw 25, 50, 100 people to these events and they're free, but they sell merch. So the merch could be you know, swords that are artisanally made or whatnot, or coffee mugs, and, you know, virtually all of them have clothing, some sort of clothing, whether it's a shirt or a jacket or whatever. So I've always wanted a place like this to exist. So there's not a specific place. Yours sounds really interesting. And, you know, the CK magic obviously is, is an old school magic. I don't actually use that spelling in my book series because I want to keep it about now. You know, these are new made up gods. I'm not trying to pull like historical references and whatnot. So I keep the K out of mine just because I don't want to be infringing on other people that know about the history of magic. I don't know about the history of magic. This is more satire on contemporary society, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Well, the ever present app is part of this modern day spiritual journey. And as we've spoken about it multiple times, the app is called the Omnist. So you've already given an explanation of what the Omnist does. Just to give potential readers a better understanding, could you uh, get a little bit more detailed and explain what exactly the app does? Yeah. So first of all, the series is called the Omnist series. So it's in every book. So the geographical center of my universe is the Emporium, and the spiritual center is the Omnis app. Usually people don't bother saying the app because there's only one Omnis, so there's that. But basically it's a companion. Um, it knows you better than any other person would. And because you've given it so much data, and it's tracking you, and it knows what you do, and it asks you questions apparently, and you, you keep answering it, it might ping you new questions tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And you can set how many moats you want to get a day. Usually people go for about six or eight within the book series. But if there's crisis in your life, it knows and it might just start pinging you more often. But sometimes it's just to get you thinking, like it may give you an aphorism that just gets you to stop doing what you're doing and think about things on a different level. And sometimes it's very cryptic. It's a spiritual companion. I think that's probably the best way to shorten it. It's a spiritual companion that because it's data that you've given it, you can trust it, supposedly. But it really is there to help you. The Omnis app itself is basically free. I mean, I say basically because it will encourage you to go to the Emporium and buy merch and do things like that. But you don't have to, you know. And then there's another level above that called the Executive Saint. 
and they pay a monthly fee, but they have access to Connie, private events with omniscience, things like that, where people like wearing an executive saint pin, you know, Mm -hmm. but you don't have to earn it in a spiritual way. It's literally just money. Mm, Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost kind of like AI in a sense. You feed it information and it learns. Yeah. Yeah. And I've avoided using those two letters. Um, <laughs> okay. Like I'll that strike is, that from the record. Oh, no. <laughs> no, you can keep it in the interview because it allows me to, to say that. Uh, uh, it's, it's just one of those things like me keeping the K off of magic. I don't use those two letters. This is supposed to be a spiritual thing. It's yeah. not meant to be AI, even though I do say algorithm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) book seven is dealing and i won't go off on too far on a tangent here because book seven is pretty far away from book one but it is dealing with that on that level of like has it developed its own consciousness in a way that it's now trying to affect a mass of people versus individuals but again that's book seven and that wouldn't come out you know probably till early next year let's say Mm -hmm. well so the App routinely sends the end user motes, which are displayed throughout the book as a, at least my interpretation, a type of epistolary fiction. Is that what you had in mind when you decided to disperse these throughout the story? And what do you feel it does for the progression and tone of the story? For me, it's a guide to remind the reader and even myself as an author that there's more going on than what you see happening. But it's not meant to be in a paranoia sense. I have several rules regarding the book. One, you have to be okay with, you know, everybody's belief system, but no guns allowed. So people die in virtually every book. A lot of the books are how do you deal with death and what is it and things like that. But it's never going to be from a gun. Like people aren't going to be shot. I feel like that's such a trope that Hollywood, whether it's television or movies, Guns are way too prevalent. And I'm not saying that they don't exist in real life. I just feel like it's a cop out. You know, hey, we need to raise the stakes. So they produce a gun. And Mm. to me, it's so overdone and I'm bored with it. And I don't want to watch movies about it. I don't want to read books about it. I'm just burnt on it. So, yes, no guns. Also, conspiracy theories. Again, the answer is not going to be it's your spouse or the cop is the crook or whatever. It's not the government. Again, mm-hmm. another trope that's played out. I'm just sick of paranoia. The whole point of this is that if somebody's paranoid, they're being reassured here. There might be paranoid people in there that have conspiracy theories, but that's probably not going to be the answer. You know? Okay. Well, so the main object of the story is Theo's purchase of a magical stringed instrument that was not really for sale, which he referred to throughout as a chordophone. I think I'm pronouncing that right. You are. And from what I looked up, it's a blanket term for a stringed instrument. So it could be multiple different types of stringed instrument. Right. Okay. And I thought it was fitting that he's an archaeologist. He's not quit his career. He's having a pre-midlife crisis in his late 20s. But he stumbles into the Emporium and he finds this object that wasn't supposed to be for sale. But an employee messed up and put a tag on it and whatnot. So basically, from what I understand through my research is that stringed instruments didn't exist in North America until Europeans brought them over. But this one, when the Europeans showed up, it was basically already there. or It was invented at that exact moment. I don't think this ruins the story. You're being very careful not to give a spoiler here, and I appreciate that. But I don't think this ruins the story. Basically, it turns out that this chordophone is made from an extinct tree that they thought was extinct, that uh, turns out there was one left. And when the Europeans came to encounter these native people in either Arizona or New Mexico, it's a little bit sketchy where this exact spot would have been. But it incorporates the teeth and the skin and the guts to make the strings of a person who basically was a coward during a battle. And using parts of that last tree, because the Europeans set it ablaze to punish or just whatever, to be dicks. So yeah, that's what that's made out of. And that instrument contains the soul, theoretically. (laughs) I say that because (laughs) we don't really know what's going on, do we? So it's imbued with these things. So basically when Theo plays it, he's getting visions. His spirit, his soul is merging with the concept of music itself and (laughs) with the soul of that person that was in there. And these three items are becoming a fourth in a way. 
So was it six stringed? Uh, four. Four. So that's why Luca called it his cuatro. Correct. Okay. Gotcha. And Lucador is the way I pronounce it. So you Lucador. Yep. All right. Well, so the chordophone that we're talking about was very rare. One of six, if I remember correctly. Yeah, as Thero did research on it, apparently there were six in existence. Mm-hmm. We don't know if there were six made around that time or if those are all imitations. They could be forgeries too. Mm. Okay. So that's what they're trying to figure out. Okay. Well, it made me think of the Stradivarius violins, mm-hmm. and I actually got to see a Dutch violinist named Simone Lamsa play the Mlynarski Stradivarius, I hope mm. I'm pronouncing that right, with the Houston Symphony. Wow. Uh, it was uh, donated to, or not not donated to her, she's playing it, what would you call it? It's on loan from an anonymous benefactor. And what's crazy is, I assume that that would be kept under armed security, but when her portion of the show was over, she came down and sat in the front seats and she had it with her. Wow. She wouldn't let it out of her Correct. sight. I started thinking like, well, you know, armed security is somewhere, you know, out of public view could be overcome and have it stolen. I seriously doubt anybody would try to grab it from her in the <laughs> middle of a crowded theater. You know what I mean? You know, I think she just wants somebody dropping it. You know, anything yeah. could happen. It doesn't have to be stolen. But for when I understand the wood, I'm no expert on musical instruments, especially violins. But for when I understand the wood that it was made from back in, what was it, the 18th and 19th century? Basically, it was a different wood than it is now. We have a different climate. So mm-hmm. you cannot make them sound like that anymore. So mm. it has been imbued with a sort of magic of that era that you just can't do. And so I absolutely think that, you know, instead of keeping that violin under a case and a lock and key and whatnot, letting people hear it, this is what makes this instrument so special. If you don't hear it, mm-hmm. you don't know. And in many ways, the value goes down. It needs to be played yeah. for the value to stay up, I think. Yeah. Can you imagine it just like rotting away or, I mean, just going stagnant on display in a museum somewhere? Correct. I doubt it's like wine. I doubt it's going to get better over time. I think you, <laughs> yeah. my question, though, would be like, what do you do about strings? I've not looked this up. I'm sure there's an answer. But, um, you know, strings. Well, have, I mean, I, I'm saying that they have a lifespan, you know. Yeah. So you're using modern strings on an ancient instrument, you know. But I mean, I still think there are places that you can get handmade strings from like whatever kind of gut they used. Yeah. I guess animals in a sense have changed because we're pumping them full of hormones. So I don't know. If, Absolutely. And we've been. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that would change the consistency or tone of strings made from their intestine or whatever they use. Yeah, I can't imagine that it wouldn't. I mean, again, Stradivarius is it's based on the type of wood they use and a wood that you can't get anymore you know so we've talked about a number of things that make the uh instruments with the particular types of wood from specific regions in a particular time period kind of explain how it imbues it with its own magical quality because it's not reproducible what inspired you to make one of the focal points of the story a rare musical instrument i had had this idea for many years since i was in college I've always felt that when I wrote songs or I played songs that had a particular tone or whatever, or sometimes even the room that you're playing in, I don't know if you play instruments or not, but even if just getting your band together in you know, junior high or high school or whatever, you'd realize that even just the room and the shape of the room, the size of the room, how many people are in there absolutely changes how you feel about the song as you're playing it. And especially at that age, it wasn't about a performance. I just wanted to lose myself in the song and lose myself in the music. And I thought that that's what musicians were supposed to be doing. And then obviously, you know, you can watch YouTube and TikTok and whatever and realize how performative it really is. And, you know, do you see people on TikTok really losing themselves in the music? Yes, there's going to be examples of people that do. But I would say the vast majority do not. It's performative. And I wanted to write a story that was about somebody being sucked into the sound and the sonic. And you think about it, that's one of our senses. You mm-hmm. can argue we only have 
as far as physical senses, we only have a couple, not five. We actually have dozens of senses, you know, hunger and they're legit things. But, you know, the sense of touch, for example, is also sound. You know, you can hear with your hands, you know, it's literally just sonic vibrations hitting your body. That's touch. And you could even argue that the sense of smell is a form of touch. Taste and smell are very tied together, but they have to come in contact with those things. So basically everything is coming in contact. And this is a way of all of his senses going into the sonic realm of touch. And then that also then can give him, what's the right word for it? Basically, he's getting visions of smell and etc. Oh, uh, what is that? Synesthesia? synesthesia. Yeah, absolutely. And I deal with synesthesia a lot. I actually book three. That's one of the main topics of it. Oh, okay. Interesting. But again, I don't want to go off on tangents because I could literally talk for 48 (laughs) hours about this stuff. Oh, yeah. So could I. Well, so kind of the spiritual mindset, you have Connie, the businesswoman, and Theo, the seeker, both of whom had experienced loss, Connie in the form of relationships, including a marriage, and Theo in the form of both of his parents. So Connie, a child as well, a child that only... Oh, yes, yes, I completely forgot, yeah. It was uh, preemie, right? Premature? Yep. Yeah. So Theo was in his late 20s, and how old was Connie? In her early 40s. Early 40s. How did their ages reflect their worldview at that moment in time? It's a really good question. I mean, obviously, they're of different generations. Mm-hmm. You know, Theo being a baby millennial and she being basically baby Gen X. So they're about a generation apart. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah, I can't speak for other generations. I'm writing for what I feel he would believe and do and what I believe she would think and do. Where they are in life, I think that in many ways, Theo is a much older soul than his age. I think he's closer to a Connie, except he's not trying to seek money, where she's still trying to seek money, which makes her, in some senses, younger than her age. So I guess in some ways, they're flip-flopped. Well, before I heard you allude to it earlier, I kind of figured that you yourself are a musician because the element of music is very heavy in the story and the scrupulous realism of the terminology you use to describe musical instruments, tunings, and things like that. So can you tell us about your relationship with music? Yeah, I don't remember not having one. I remember being too little to even get my fingers up a guitar and I wanted to play and that's all I wanted. And I eventually started playing piano for many years. And then when I could really grasp guitar, I started playing as well. So I I mean, I played in bands with my friends in junior high, high school, college, played some shows around Detroit. But when I was 22, I was very lucky. Right out of college, I got a job at a record company in LA and it was an adult job. I wasn't somebody's intern or assistant or whatnot. I was too green for that job. Like I said, I was very fortunate. I understand that. And I just stopped. I started working with real musicians and you see how hard that life is. I think people glamorize it. They sit in their bedroom, they make a really cool song and it deserves to be heard. But I don't know that most people are built for the actual grueling life of being a touring musician. It's Mm. ridiculous. I burned out on it. I'm not even in the industry anymore. So my first real career out of college, even though I had gone for writing, was at a record company. So I did that for 13 years and managed bands for another five years. And now I'm back to writing, which is my original career choice, if that makes sense. Even though nobody's a writer to get rich, you know, that's like (laughs) winning the lottery. So no one says, I've got a plan for the rest of my life. I'm just going to spend every single dollar on lottery tickets. And there are people that do that, but it's probably not the smartest move. No. Now, was there a uh, particular point in your life where you kind of came to the conclusion that music itself was a form of magic? You know, it's such a good question because I don't know that I'd ever parse them separately. But coming to a realization of what magic really is, to me, is your body and mind becoming in sync with its environment And music is a really great way. I mean, you basically can't name a religion that doesn't use music. 
Um, it's a it's a way for people to tune into themselves. And I'd always wanted to do that, sort of hacking myself using music. And I had done that since I was writing my first songs in junior high. And there's something about sharing that, like, hey, look at this. This worked on me. Does this work with you as well? Do we have this mood in common? And I think that's the magic of it. You know, instead of one person being in sync, now you can get multiple people in sync. Or if you're the Beatles, you can get tens of millions of people in sync. That's just such an amazing gift. You know, talk about not feeling alone in the world. If you can connect on that level with somebody. But I'm relatively tone deaf. And I say relatively because I do play. I've sung back up in the bands that I played with and whatever, but I do not have a strong enough voice. I go flat. Um, that just wasn't my thing. I'm not a performer. Um, I just mm. wanted to, again, hack magic in a way. And I feel like writing is like that too. As I'm like yeah. touching a copy of my book like an idiot. <laughs> like that's going to help you. <laughs> It's the same thing. If somebody else reads this and has the same feeling I had while writing it, that's that same magic that I'm talking about. You know, I yeah. just hope they can do it and I hope I'm pulling it off. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, music, writing, any kind of art, I would argue is magic. Yeah. Because it influences people. It influences people outside of yourself and I don't know if it influences the outside world outside of people, but it definitely holds like this hypnotic sway over other people's minds. 100%. And what's funny is that Uxian, who's one of the main characters in, in several of the books, uh, he gets a POV in book four, but he's one of these people that he believes in science above magic. Um, mm -hmm. He's one of the types that believes that, you know, magic is just undiscovered science. But yet, when it comes down to it, he believes that we live in a simulated universe. And in some way, that's the same as any other religion, because you can't <laughs> prove it wrong. It's like, well, yeah, the flying spaghetti monster again. You know, you can't uh -huh. prove there isn't one, so therefore there is one. But I think it's funny because he's so scientific-based. And I love that. It's the spiritualism of science. So he's an, he's an omniscient as well. You know, that's how inclusive they are there. You can go in and just speak science and technology. That counts. Yeah, he's so scientific that he delves into the philosophy of science to where he backs himself into like this sort of nihilism. That's exactly like, right. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever heard of Peter Shostead Hughes or read any of his stuff? I'm not familiar. So he is a philosopher of mind that utilizes psychedelics, specifically psilocybin, to kind of assist nice. him in his philosophical work. And he identifies his philosophical stance as a ontic agnostic. So basically he doesn't think there's enough proof one way or the other that we exist. Like ontic is an ontology, like the philosophy of being. He's a really interesting guy. You should check him out. <laughs> yeah. And these, these sort of things are really good exercises to go through. But obviously if you're, conclusion is we don't exist what happens is that you know society really would fall apart mm -hmm. in my opinion an anarchist doesn't believe that there should be violence it's that we would self-police and there would be actually less violence mm -hmm. that you're believing in human nature to yeah. overcome whatever like laws you're born into and you know ruling classes and whatever but I believe when you back yourself up to a point where we don't exist, you get in a mindset of nothing matters. And once you believe nothing yeah. matters, then you might start destroying the environment. You might start mm -hmm. killing people next to you, et cetera. And I don't know about you, but I see a lot of that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You lose empathy if you believe nothing matters, truly believe nothing matters. Yeah. When I say nothing matters, I mean these constructs don't matter, but people matter. Yeah. Humanity matters. Our magic, our soul, our sense of being matters, but the constructs don't matter. The perception of wealth and status Correct. and all that are just like, says who? Exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. Well, Consumia's Emporium had a room in the back called the Dark Arts Room. And I was wondering, I don't know if you would refer to your practice as purely spiritual, if you would attach the moniker of a cult to it, but 
regardless of how you describe it, does any of it include anything of the left hand path variety, um, which the, is what I would yeah. assume would be kept in the dark arts room? <laughs> yeah, there's definitely left hand path. But again, I'm trying not to rely on what people already believe in with occultism. Mm-hmm. I'm not an expert on this stuff. I tend to make up more of this stuff. Again, I'm making fun of our current society that you can virtually say anything and people will believe it. But that doesn't mean that the beliefs don't matter. It's just the consumerism aspect of it. I'm not trying to trash anybody's actual beliefs. That's why I make up stuff. When I say I don't want to offend them, I don't want to offend people that have real beliefs. Mm -hmm. I'm making fun of the consumerism of belief more so than the beliefs themselves, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Well, we were just talking about him. I would say my favorite character, especially as far as the gurus are concerned, is Uxian. That's how it's pronounced, right? Yes, it means lonely in Finnish. And so, as we said, he's a man of science to the effect that he almost backs himself into this nihilistic corner. Can you tell me about his creation and what you wanted his character to add to the story? I wanted him to balance using science because I feel that a lot of spirituality, they use too much pseudoscience and he's trying to actually use science, but he does back himself into that corner where at some point it becomes pseudo. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he's the balance of science versus religion. He's the other end of the spectrum and he's a goth. And as you can see, I have a little bit of that in me as well. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there was a mention of him being... I don't know if he espoused it himself or it was just other people kind of had this opinion of him as some sort of vampire. Yeah, yeah. He's always accused of being a vampire because he never goes out and he's as pale as it gets and whatnot. Just because of his aesthetic and behavior, not because he told people he was a... Correct. (laughs) The undead. He he always always says, that's not me. Like, I'm just me. Why are you guys doing this? That's part of that construct, you know? Yeah. Well, as it says in the book description, one of the main incidents that takes place in the book is the death of one of the customers in the dark arts room. And this incident adds fuel to the fire of the neighborhood rumors that the Emporium is evil and satanic and they're all up to no good. And it reminded me of something that happened in Houston. There was a Luciferian group that tried to open a church called the Greater Church of Lucifer. This guy, I don't know if he's affiliated with the Magic Cauldron or not, but I've heard people talk about, oh, we're going to go hang out with Michael Ford tonight. So, you know, he's kind of a local celebrity. But after multiple incidents of vandalism, they had to close the church after less than a year because the landlord wouldn't renew their lease because he was receiving death threats. And you mentioned a few shops there in Burbank. I imagine California is a little bit more liberal-minded Has there ever been any sort of neighborhood wariness or problems with any of the shops that you frequented? Yeah, I don't know what the situations of these shops are. I can't speak for them, but your story about that shop, that just rings very true to me. I was not familiar with that, but I I hear a lot of uh, similarity between that and this with the Emporium. So yeah, the Luciferian thing sounds very interesting to me. Yeah, I didn't know because you included that aspect, if that was something you had dealt with. It seemed oddly specific because I think, where does Consumia is purported to be? Uh, it's in North Hollywood on Lancashire. North Hollywood. But I mean, obviously yeah. it's fictional, but... Yeah. 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 yeah, so it seems like there, there wouldn't be a problem, but... I remember way back in the day, which would be, what, 1969, when Anton LaVey founded the Church of Satan, his entire neighborhood was aghast at that. But I guess that was technically still a more conservative time. And I think most of their complaints was the fact that he had a live lion in his house. So maybe that had something to do with it. (laughs) Or he just put himself up to the excuse, you know, like now they can have more issues with him on something that had nothing to do with his beliefs. Sometimes you have to be more careful. Well, so of all the gurus, the one with the most charisma was obviously Lucador. 
So what exactly was the spirituality he was espousing? Can you explain it for us? <laughs> you're asking, <laughs> asking, asking, <laughs> you're asking anybody to explain Lucador? Like, I don't even think, I think <laughs> he himself would give you a different answer every time. Chop that question into bits, you know, <laughs> smallest parts. You can't deal with that, chop it smaller. Yeah, he's just all persona. And he is a POV in book three. Uh, so you get to understand a little bit more of his mindset, but he's a comical character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's a hard question to answer. Okay. Well, there are five books in the Omnis series. Are these books able to stand alone? Yes. And if so, what ties them together? What ties them together is the Omnis app. Because anybody can use that app. They could be witches. They could be undead. They could just be a married couple. Anybody can have problems. And then geographical location is the Emporium. So you do see repeat executive saints and other consumerians, repeat omniscience, who are the gurus that you speak of. You know, you'll see Connie popping in and out of books and whatever. But every book is a standalone. So it's an anthological series in that sense. But basically every book, except for the first one, is two POVs. Every sequel is three. I find I can triangulate truth better because this is close third person. So you're sort of in their heads, but it's still third person. There will be one or two brand new people you've never met and one or two people that are affiliated with the Emporium. They could be an omniscient. It could be one of the employees, whatnot. So by using brand new people, I can come in with completely different angle for each book. They can be vastly different. But there are Easter eggs. If you do read the series all the way through, there will be threads that continue. You know, somebody that was a POV in book one or two might pop up again in book four, and you see them a little further along in a particular type of journey or something. So there are Easter eggs. But a couple of the people that have left me reviews have actually read them out of order. They started at book four, and then five, and then went back to one, two, three. But yeah, there are definitely standalone books. Gotcha. Well, which book radically altered your view of what could be accomplished with the written word? Ooh. House of Leaves from Mark Z. Danielewski. Have you read that? I have not. It's about as postmodern as postmodernism gets. Part of the story is told in the way the text is actually laid out on the page. Basically, the reason you've never seen it as a movie yet, even though it was a bestseller and I'm assuming sold millions of books, is that how do you present this in a visual format that's not the book itself? Mm. So it just made me realize that you can do things that transcend the page, that use the page and then becomes immersive. I felt that by creating this fictional app that feels like something that people really could be using right now, it's doing the same thing. It's sort of transcending the page and becoming part of your life. My goal is that people read these moats and you might think of that later in the day. I had somebody send me a little video of a rock they painted that had a moat on it. And I believe the moat was change is only possible through failure. Mm. And I guess that was ringing in his head and he sent me photographs of this rock that he painted while <laughs> camping with this moat around it. And it was really cool. And that is what I want. I would love for people to have this stuff ringing around in their head and to be moved by it. And remember, this isn't top down. I'm not telling people how to run their lives. But I think that with the distraction environment that we're in now, people aren't introspective enough in general. Mm -hmm. there's always introspective people. So I don't mean to be saying there aren't any, but I would love people to be more so. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, uh, I was looking at the book that I had, um, highlighted two. I, I believe they're both moats. One is everyone is going to hurt you. Stay with people worth hurting for. Yes. You're going to hurt them too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then the other one was, even when life isn't worth living, life isn't worth dying for either. <laughs> that's right. And that that's that whole nihilism aspect, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But yeah, those sound like they were remotes. Well, when you began to write and publish your work, you know, the point where you went from just kind of dabbling to, I wrote something, I published, here it is, world. 
Was there anything specific in your life going on at the time that you feel contributed to bringing your writing to completion? Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar. There was this thing called a pandemic that happened recently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that little okay, kerfuffle. So, <laughs> so technically, though, like I had written, even while working at record companies, I was on airplanes a lot and airports a lot, and there was downtime in places that weren't home. So I was always writing, but it would take me five years to write a book and they weren't very good. And then I had actually completed three novels before Consumia. And again, they weren't very good, but this one took, it was a little bit shorter. I completed, you know, the first two drafts in about two and a half years, but it took the first year of the pandemic for me to complete it. And I had gotten a pretty good groove going. I was writing four or five days a week. Actually, I'm going to back up one year again when the pandemic started. The job I was working laid everybody off. And so, you know, you're collecting unemployment. My body started waking up at 4.30 in the morning. I'd fall asleep at 9 or 10. It was crazy. And I read 60 novels in 52 weeks. Wow. 52 of them were brand new. Eight of them were rereads of other books that I loved. And yeah, that sounds great, except I wasn't writing. Mm. I did complete Consumia, but it took me a year to write the last 40,000 words, which is not very much at all if you've got a lot of time to write uh, with the pandemic. So, but I'd gotten a pretty good groove at the very tail end and I was writing four or five days a week. And I just thought for fun, while I sent this, my best friend at the time, he was a professor at University of Michigan. He taught English and film theory and things like that. And he's a great beta reader for me. So I had him looking over the manuscript and I thought to myself, well, I don't want to lose this pattern I'm on. I should write a sequel, but just for fun, I'm going to try to do NaNoWriMo which I'm sure you heard of, you know, try to do 50,000 words in 30 days. It's a great way to kickstart people into writing a novel. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to do it. And it turned out I wrote 30 straight days and I did 60,000 words. And that was the first draft of Mostly Human, Mostly Cat. And he still hadn't completed the notes for me yet. So I'm like, what the hell? I'll try this again. And I wrote The Honest and the Cosmic Egg, 60,000 words in 30 days. And by this point, he had given me back the notes, but, you know, I'm on a tear. I've just written 60 straight days. So I did it again and again and again <laughs> and again. I wrote seven sequels in seven months, and I didn't miss a day of writing my... At that time, I was calling it, it needed to be a thousand words. If I had to go to work that day, I would write at five o'clock in the morning or 3,000 word minimum if I wasn't working, but I needed to be averaging 2,000 words a day completely. But I had to turn the spigot off because I needed to go back and revise book one or else what's the point of doing all this? I'm just writing into a void. Mm -hmm. So then it changed to I needed to put at least two hours a day in minimum into revisions and whatever. Because, I mean, you know, three hours of revision might net minus 500 words. And I'm just as stoked about minus 500 words as I am about plus 2,500 words because I know the document's getting better. Mm -hmm. And really, that's the whole point. So yeah, the pandemic helped tremendously. And, you know, people suffered greatly. Tens of millions of people were affected. Because if you yourself didn't die, <laughs> you had family and friends that had to deal with this. And people lost jobs and houses. And, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like a horrible human saying that I actually benefited from it. Because I did. But I'm also naturally an introvert who drinks coffee in order to be able to do things like this. Yeah. And also why I burned out working in the music industry, because it just doesn't take breaks. Yeah. You know, and I, I needed a lot of time to myself. So yeah. it's it took a pandemic to really make me what I consider a writer now. Gotcha. And just so you know, these first drafts were god awful. Um, <laughs> I had an editor and she's wonderful, Ashley. I won't even send her anything till there's five drafts because the first drafts are that bad. But the point is, uh, get the idea out. You can't revise what you didn't write. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, speaking to the genre, I am a lover of all things dark, hence the name of the podcast, especially noir. So I was wondering what the specific draw was to magical noir. You know, as with a lot of people, Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler, I've uh, read many, many of their books. And I think what's overlooked in noir is just the self-journey that these detectives are going on. They're learning about themselves when they're dealing with 
solving this exterior problem. Mm -hmm. And I love the tone and the descriptions and it's visceral. Like you can taste the smog in these books and feel the dust. And I wanted to capture that. And it's a very LA thing. I know Dashiell's like San Francisco, but it's the same idea. And I wanted to capture that, but make it modern. But yet, you know, you virtually can't have noir without a gun. Mm. So Mm -hmm. it needs to be magical. And plus, I just find it's a different tool. But yeah, noir is definitely a, it's a vibe. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Well, what is your, uh, (laughs) when you're doing these five drafts you were speaking of, what is your uh, writing medium and atmosphere? I would say 90% of my writing is done at home and I have a small apartment in Silver Lake. And I had mentioned to you before that I intentionally got rid of my Wi-Fi and my cable Mm. so that I wouldn't have these distractions. And part of the problem was, especially that first year of the pandemic, I was binge watching. So like I would read for four or five hours in the morning and then binge watch the entire rest of the day and realize I wasn't getting any writing done. I was depressed and I'm like, you know, this sounds weird. I can't leave the house. I can't go anywhere. This is a desert island and everybody talks about the dream. When I say everybody, I mean a lot of writers talk about the dream of being in a cabin up on a mountain with no internet Mm -hmm. and just forcing yourself to write for 30 days. I'm like, I can do this right now. This is a gift. I need to do this. So I did. And I still don't have those things because it's been working. So 90% of it is written at home. Sometimes I'll go to a coffee shop, you know, tell Gentia Coffee on, on Sunset, and I'll sit there and work for a while. Sometimes I'll go to a pub. I call it a pub <laughs> as if there's really a pub near me, a bar. Uh-huh. And so we're like, but yeah, 90% of it is just me at home dealing, you know. And it's great because I don't have any distractions. I don't have anybody looking over my head, mm-hmm. you know, looking over my shoulder saying, why are you ignoring me? You know? What is your medium? What are you writing on? Just the same MacBook Air that I'm talking to you on right now. Oh, okay. So you have a computer. You just don't have anything to connect it to to distract you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, besides distractions like the internet and binge watching, is there anything you avoid because you feel it stifles your creativity? Not so much necessarily distracts you from writing, but kind of screws you out of the creative process? Yeah, I would say mostly it would be drinking. Hmm. And everybody's heard, you know, the Hemingway, you know, write drunk, edit sober. sober. (laughs) But, But to be fair, though, I've gone long periods of time without drinking at all. And I'm far more creative when I'm not drinking. I think that stifles me more. It's not that I don't drink. I work in a bar. I absolutely drink, but I've gone long periods of time without it. And I am more creative at those times. But it's also like, is that exactly the life I want to live? Do I want to be sober the rest of my life? And, you know, it's striking a balance between the two. Yeah. You know, if I go three, four days without drinking, I am more creative. And then I'll go out with a friend and have a couple drinks and I'm fine. But I am going to be foggier the next day. Even just two beers, you can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? Well, do you think that the world we live in could benefit from a return to some sort of spiritual practice to quell the rise of materialism and nihilism, just like Nietzsche warned us about? And if so, because of our technological world, would it look something like the omnists? And can you expand on that concept? I don't know the answer to that because I think it's so intertwined. I mean, I think self-reflection is pretty much all we have because anything else is going to be tied to materialism. It's going to be tied to consumerism and finances and just the money system that we're in. I don't think that there's a return to spiritualism that's going to help. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be consumerism attached to it no matter what. I would just say that, you know, people becoming more self-reflective and self-aware is the only tool we have, in my opinion. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, any business that sells esoteric wares, any church, anything like that. I mean, it doesn't run on sunshine and happy thoughts. It takes money. So (laughs) there's going to be consumerism involved. So yeah, Yeah. it's kind of something you have to take upon yourself. Yeah. So 
What is the life of Rob Weldon like outside of writing? Uh, pretty boring. <laughs> I work in a craft beer bar. Oh, and um, that doesn't sound I, boring. <laughs> you know what it is? I feel like I'm boring, but I'm never bored. Ah. I'm a bartender, a beer tender. <laughs> you know, I don't pour mixed drinks. I love talking about craft beer. I love talking about music. I love talking about books. But that's really about it. I don't have a lot of hobbies outside of writing and reading. And even reading's taken a backseat. You know, I've gone from reading. I used to read... 12 to 20 books a year. Then, you know, that first year of the pandemic was sort of a windfall of books. And now I'm down to three or four books a year again, because I'm writing so much. It's just taking up that time. And I know you need to keep reading to be a better writer, but if I'm inspired to write, I'm not going to turn it off either. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, Rob, it has been a pleasure talking with you. Vince, thank you so much. Uh, These questions are amazing very well thought out and it's making me think like you inadvertently probably affecting book six, which I'm going through a revision number six right now with my notes from my editor. So there's no way that you're not affecting the next book is what I'm saying. Thank you. I hope it's positive for you. (laughs) Very much so. Yeah. (laughs) Well, as we bring the show to a close, is there anything you'd like to plug or let your readers know about? Yeah, so this was Consuming a Spiritual Emporium. Book two is mostly human, mostly cat. And I know that there are people that love their pets more than their significant other. (laughs) And this takes that to an extreme example. Mm. (laughs) So that's book two, if anyone's interested in that. You know, this doesn't give it away because this happens in the first few chapters. But yeah, uh, a witch, she's basically changing her exes into cats because she likes cats better than them. (laughs) Oh, if only. (laughs) So different from book one. Yeah. And then book three is just as different again. There's a condition called Cotard's delusion where you literally think you're dead. You might walk into traffic because, you know, the car's the drive right through you. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm already already passed. Or you may not eat because dead people don't need to eat. But what happens when a guy who's got a family has Cotard's and he gets in a car accident and he spends the rest of the book trying to convince people he's still alive? instead of convincing them he's dead. And I think that's just funny. (laughs) The irony. Uh Uh-huh. Gotcha. And then, of course, there's five so far. You got six in the works? Yeah, number four is the patina of Dorothy Grant. So basically, if you're familiar with a picture of Dorian Gray, that's a 19-year-old male dandy in the Victorian era. This would be an 18-year-old female with social media that takes on all her sins. Mm. And what's worse, I think, a social media influencer whose social media gets progressively uglier and uglier very quickly, mm-hmm. I think that would drive somebody up a wall. And I think that makes this a lot of fun. And then uh, book five is Wide Eyed Wyatt's Liquid Nap. And that one is about the god of sleep. And he's trying to kill somebody who works at a coffee roaster. And you would think that it's about him working with the devil's juice with coffee. But no, he wants to kill him for a different reason. And I think that's also, there's a lot of irony in my books, I guess. It's all dark humor, you know? <laughs> which also reminds me, you had mentioned something before about marketing and merch and whatnot. I made t-shirts for Consumer Spiritual Emporium, and I sold out that run, mostly cat t-shirts. Those ran out. And then Wide Eyed Why is the first time I did two items. I did coffee mugs because they drink that product in the book to stay awake while they're trying to figure out how to defeat the god of sleep. And so I made t-shirts and coffee mugs for that. And I'm doing small runs, but they're selling out. So that makes me feel good that, you know, this approach to marketing your books, like I feel like I'm an unsigned artist, you know, I'm Mm -hmm. an unsigned band and my events, my lodges are getting bigger, you know, from 40 people to 50 people to 75 people. And so it's basically a lodge in real life. So I've had different omniscient speak you know, the science fiction writer, Bill Sean, he's been nominated for a Hugo Award, a Nebula Award. He's great. Jane Asher, she runs a podcast called The Next Room, and she wrote a book called The Next Room, mm-hmm. and those are affiliated. And uh, Burton C. Bell, he was a singer of Fear Factory. I have a gold record of theirs on my wall at home. Oh, wow. And he read the synopsis for each song on the Obsolete record, which was their gold album here in the U.S., each song is basically like a chapter of a longer book, a longer narrative. So I'm just so 
incredibly honored that these people that I feel are further up the food chain than me are working with me and they love the concept of the lodge. So, you know, off camera, I'd love to talk to you if you know anybody that would want to do the next lodge. I've done three so far, the fourth one to be coming up several months from now. But yeah, so the lodges are fun too. All right. Well, sounds good. Listeners at home, all links are in the description. And Rob, thank you again for joining me. Thank you so much, Vince. This was awesome. You're incredible. Thank you. And thank you to everyone that tuned in. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And if you're a fan of creepy pasta narrative fiction, be sure to check out the Mind of Midgard YouTube channel by clicking the link in the description. Be sure to tune in next Tuesday when I will be joined by a writer that has created a dystopian fiction with Darwinian proportions. So until then, stay healthy, stay sane, and as always, thank you for listening. See you next time. Barely breathing, don't let go. Hear the whispers, listen close. I know you've never strayed from the fold, but that's how freedom begins. Bend it. Burn your bridges, make your choice Fight your demons, raise your voice They're only silent if we're making noise So let the battle begin